Happy Sunday, Trinity, New York. How are you feeling? Feeling good? I'm grateful that you're here. If you're new, my name's Kristen Wilkerson. My husband Taylor and I are the lead pastors here at Trinity, and we want to welcome you. We have been in a special series for all mankind, and it's been about how Jesus is for everyone. I don't know what you've heard. I don't know where you've been. I don't know what you see as you scroll on social media, but hear it from me. Jesus is for everyone. There's not one person that he doesn't love and want to know and have relationship with. And last week, our friend Kendra Daniels preached so beautifully. Come on, put your hands together and powerfully. And today on Palm Sunday, I'm sharing a message with you titled Extra Credit, Extra Credit. And I'm excited about the word that God has for you and for me. You've heard us talk about it before, uh, but if you're new here, we've got four kids, four little ones. And, you know, it's always funny to me because people will ask me, they'll say, how did you know you were ready for a fourth? You see, I love that question. And I think that sometimes we think that, you know, maybe Taylor and Kristen one day, we were just walking uh, around the city with our three crazy kids. And we just said, you know what, we're just bored. We're just bored, and life is too simple. Add another kid into the mix. Uh, no, I don't know that you're ever really ready for more. Uh, what I've learned in my walk with Jesus, what I've learned in my life is that it's not that I'm just ready and then God puts what I want in my lap. It's often my hands are full, my life is full, and God gives me more and he stretches my capacity. Let me tell you today, God, he wants to stretch you. He wants to grow you. In fact, he he doesn't want you to stay right where you are. He's always looking for more. I love how sometimes at the beginning of the year, we'll have like a phrase for our year, more in 2024. Was that anyone's faith declaration? But what do you do when the more feels not just more than you can imagine, but maybe more than you can handle. Ephesians chapter 3, I love it. The message translation says this, God can do anything, you know. Where are my people who know that God can do anything? Where are my people who can testify to the goodness of God? You are a living, breathing miracle. God can do anything. He can do anything far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. Listen to this. I love it. He does it not by pushing you around. No, but by working within you. His spirit deeply and gently within you. And sometimes we look at that scripture and we say, God can do more. More than we could ask. More than we can imagine, and it's great to preach, but what do we do when the more doesn't just feel like blessing, but a burden? When the more is, God, I'm exhausted, my hands are full, how could you give me more, the responsibility, the weight of it all? It feels like it might be too much more in 2024, but God, what do I do when I can't handle it? when it gets heavy, when it gets hard to carry. Anyone know what I'm talking about today? See, now that I've had four babies, um, I can tell you that women did not come up with the six-week postpartum rule that you can work out. A man must have come up with that because no woman is ready at six weeks to just get back in the gym. And I know this from experience because after I had my first baby, I was feeling good. I had had a decent night of sleep, and I said, you know what? I'm cleared by the doctor to go to the gym. I'm signing myself up for a class. I'm going to get away for a moment. And, you know, I didn't consider that a cycling class may not have been the class for a postpartum mother. And, um, yes, we're laughing, but... Some of us are cringing right now, right? And three minutes in, I was like, nope, this is not going to work. I'm done. I'm not doing this. 
And I, I went back to the gym the next week and I actually scheduled a health assessment test. And this trainer, you know, he's really just trying to sell me, but uh, I needed the, the test to be able to figure out how I was going to move forward and how I was going to get strong again. Your muscles move when you have a baby, and you've got to work to get them back into a stable place. And so he's checking my height. He's checking my weight. He's seeing how my breath work is when I run, which was very, very bad and still is to this day. And not only that, he had me do a plank, which was no plank at all. It was me lying flat on my face uh, on the floor in the gym. I wasn't ready. I couldn't do it. And one of the things that he encouraged me, he said, listen, it's okay that you're not where you need to be. This is a test. And tests aren't to show you anything more than just that here's where you are and here's where you're determined to be. And that's exactly what tests are like in our life of faith as well. God uses tests to show you, to reveal to you where you are and where he wants you to be. It reveals, it exposes the intentions, the conditions of our hearts. When you start to get tested, it changes things for you. It's easy to say, God, I'm ready. Lord, send me, use me when we're not tested. But in the middle of the test, you're thinking, God, have you left me? Have you abandoned me? Where are you in this season of my life? And God's saying, I want to develop you. I want to grow you. I want to show you that I put more in you than what you're living for right now. I've got great plans and a great future for you. I'm going to test you so I can see how much you can handle because I've prepared to bless you. But can you handle it? It's a test. And in scripture, we see tests over and over again. You see, he determined, he looked at my weight, the trainer, to see how much I would be able to lift. And as I learned how to lift and I learned how to strengthen myself, as I started to build my core again, it gave me endurance to have the health I needed to be a strong woman again. See, Abraham, he knew a lot about testing, right? I love his story. It's so significant in scripture in so many ways. But in Genesis chapter 17, he wasn't called Abraham yet. He was Abram. Let me share the story with you. Verse 1, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations, and I'll make you fruitful. I'll make nations of you. Kings will come from you. I'll establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you. And for your descendants, after you generations to come, I'm going to be your God and their God. See, Abram, at this current moment, God is speaking to Abraham's potential. Not quite where Abraham is yet. And I love it because God, he's so faithful and he's so good that he'll start calling you by a new name that holds the promise before you actually see the promise in your life. Because he wants to see if you can rise to the occasion. Can you be the person that he's called to be? Can you be the one who's able to actually handle the weight of descendants to come after you generation after generation? Are you going to be able to carry the faith? Are you going to be able to obey me when it's hard? He gave him this name, this promise, and it was something to look forward to. But imagine Abraham. Every time he heard his name, he was reminded that his hands were still empty. Abraham, father of many nations, 
And there he is with no children. Abraham, come here. He's thinking, God, why would you call me this while my wife is still barren? It was a weight test. Today, I want you to know, as you grow in your faith, there will be weight tests. Can you handle the waiting? And here's what I found. A waiting season is never a wasted season. You might feel like it's wasted, but not with God. He sees time differently than you do. He sees that in the waiting, he can speak to you. He can develop you. He can discipline you. He can correct you. He can redirect you. If you can be faithful in the way, he can trust you with more. A waiting season. I remember Taylor and I, we, when we were dating, we had a moment where we broke up for almost a whole year. And it was a waiting season for me because here's the truth. I knew he was my husband. I knew that we were going to be together. I knew God had plans for us. But I look back at that season, and it was full of heartbreak. I felt like God had forgotten about me and my 22-year-old self. I felt like my life was derailed, you know. And, um, but I'll never forget that season of my life, God showing me the areas of my life that were so insecure, showing me that my identity was faulty, that I was trying to define who I was by who I was with. And he wanted to make sure that I knew who I was in him. It was a season in my life that maybe it would have felt like, oh, this is wasted. Oh, this is heartbreak. This is terrible. I'm depressed. I'm sad. But God was using that season to work in my heart and develop a woman of God in me that I wouldn't be without it. Come on, is anyone grateful for some of those waiting seasons? Because if you had been given the promise early, you would have ruined it. You wouldn't have been who he called you to be. He uses it to develop you, to train you, to disciple you. I love people who really want discipleship. Discipleship is a lifelong journey. Lifelong, my friend. And you're like, well, I've been coming three months. I just don't feel discipled. Try another three years. Let's talk about it then. Most people can't even give church a couple months of their life. <gasps> Come on, you've got to allow God to develop you and work within you. He wants to be able to see who you really are in the waiting seasons. If you go to the doctor, oftentimes when they look at your weight, your body mass, they can they can see and get a picture of the health of your heart. The more weight, the often unhealthy your heart may be. Maybe underweight, your heart might not be where it needs to be. It affects your heart health. And I think that waiting seasons do the same. In the waiting, you start to believe lies that God is not a faithful God. In the waiting season, we can start to, to doubt God's plan and God's purposes for us. In the waiting season, we can start to feel left out, all alone, rejected, and abandoned. It starts to expose your heart. And I promise you today that if you decide to be faithful to God in a waiting season, he will develop a healthy heart within you. A heart that isn't easily offended. A heart that's able to stay planted even when they don't see the fruit they want to see. A heart that's able to praise God even before you see him move in your life. A heart that's able to say, God, I know who you are and I'm not going to throw this thing away. I'm going to keep showing up. I'm going to keep believing. I'm going to keep giving. I'm going to keep trusting because I believe you're working. 
working in me, I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to wait on you. Because aren't you grateful that he waited on you? Aren't you grateful that he didn't get fed up with you and your mess trying to destroy your life? But he said, no, I'm waiting on you. You might not be where you want to be yet, but come on, are you grateful that you're not where you were? That God took you out of the mess you were in and placed you on the solid ground of Jesus. Come on, somebody, give him praise. Thank you, Lord. You waited on me. What is it, God, for me to wait on you? I'm going to wait on you. You know, as you continue to live your life with Jesus, you'll find that surrender doesn't have an age limit. Let me remind you in this scripture that Abram was how old? 99. Anyone 99 in the room? 99. Waiting, 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 waiting. I've never gotten with God and prayed and kind of felt like God was like, you know what, Kristen, you've just surrendered enough, girl. You're good. Just sit back, relax, enjoy. I don't need anything more from you. The, the more... The more developed and discipled I've become, the more I've gotten to know Jesus, the more I've recognized that he always wants more. He wants more of my heart. Surrender looked like giving up toxic patterns in the past. Now it looks like giving up toxic heart conditions. Surrender looked like closing doors on certain relationships. Now it looks like serving someone even when I don't feel like it. Surrender may have looked like three years ago giving up drinking or giving up drugs, but now it looks quite different. It's about the way that you talk about people behind their back. He never allows us to get to an age where surrender doesn't matter. He's always saying, I want more from you. I want more of your life. I want your whole heart. I want your whole mind. Surrender it all to me. Will you be faithful in the wait? And it kind of comes down to this idea because it's fun to talk about the more we can imagine. And a lot of our faith walk is that. I hope that you have seasons in your life where you think about the more that you can imagine that God wants to do. He wants to do more. He wants your business to grow. He wants you to be successful. I don't know what churches you've been to. God wants you to be a blessing, to be blessing to others. He wants to increase you. In every way, he wants you to have greater influence. All of those things are true. They're more than you can imagine. Bigger platforms. He, he wants all of that for you. But then we've got to talk about the more that we can handle, though. Because it's not always about the dream. Sometimes it's about surrendering the very thing that God promised us and gave us. It's about putting the promise back into his holy hands. It doesn't always feel like a blessing to talk about the more. Sometimes it feels like a burden. But what if the burden today isn't to break you, but to strengthen you? See, when we talk about the weight, when you get back in the gym, you start small. Start with those little weights, right? Can you lift this weight? Once you pass the weight test, you're given the lift test. Are you able to lift? You see, here's the thing. Abraham, it was hard to wait. I'm sure Abraham doubted. We actually know that he did in Scripture. But he still did have a word from God that something good was on the way. But then there comes a moment where it's not just that the good is on the way, but the good is there. God gives him the son. He's promised him Isaac. I mean, think about it. Just incredible. They're old, and they've got this new baby, and their 
their whole lives have been turned upside down. The thing that they prayed for, they cried over. Think of the joy of being able to care for that baby and be reminded of the promises of God. But then there comes a moment when God requests more. He requests more. And, and this is where Abraham has to learn how to lift, right? And some of you, you got... You think that where you are in the waiting season you're in is difficult. And I promise you, it is. I, I know that it is. But some of those things are small weights compared to what God is going to ask of you in the future. I was 22 waiting on the husband. That felt like a big weight then, right? But it was small weight, really. Maybe you're waiting on a financial breakthrough, waiting on a solution, waiting on a reconciliation, waiting on a job promotion. It's small weight when you consider what God might ask of you, which could be everything. Genesis chapter 22 says that sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac, and when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Father, yes, my son, fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. And the two of them went on together. And when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and he laid him or perhaps lifted him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and took his knife to slay his son. But... The angel of the Lord called out and said, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Don't do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you've not withheld your only son. He looked up and he saw a thicket, a ram in the thicket caught by its horns. He went over and he sacrificed the ram and they called that place, the Lord will provide. Quite a difference in stories, right? Abraham promised a son in his old age more than he can imagine. Abraham asked to sacrifice his only son more than he can handle. See the contrast here. There will be tests in our life. You'll look back at waiting seasons and you'll go, oh, that was nothing to what God is asking me to lift right now. Will I be faithful to surrender the very thing that God gave me? Will you be obedient to what he asks of you when surrender comes? When sacrifice knocks at your door, will you be able to lift and to pass the test? Can God trust you with it? And I'm so grateful that God, he, he doesn't leave us on our own in carrying the heavy burdens. Psalm 55, 22 says this, cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never let the righteous be shaken. He says, give me your burdens. Let me carry them. Let me be the one to hold you as you lift. 
lift the heavy burdens of your life and you surrender them to me. So often, though, we mismanage our submission and our surrender. We think that surrender is all within our own strength. And I came to tell you today that Abraham, he had to lift his son onto the altar. But the good news today is that Jesus, he was lifted up on the cross and paid the ultimate price for you and for me. Arms stretch wide. I can handle it. I'll take her place. I'll take his place. He saw me and you, and he chose to take the burden of sin and shame on his back so that you and I could take our burdens. And listen, I know they're great. I know. I'm not... I'm not naive enough to think that no one in this room has real great burdens. I know some of you today, it's so heavy. Even getting to church today was a battle. You weren't sure if you could put one foot in front of the other because of the weight that you're carrying. But I believe God today, he's ready to lift your arms up. And he's ready to take the heavy burden from you. He's a good God. And he won't let you carry anything alone. God, I want to pass the weight test. I want to pass the lift test. And once I've learned to wait and to lift, you and I were given the endurance test. Can you keep going? Can you keep going? We know that runners, as they train for a race, they often have a detailed schedule of how much they're going to run each day and each week. And the reason I say it that way is because I cannot relate. I have no personal experience in this matter. But what I've learned is that oftentimes, almost all the time, it's completely unwise to run the entire marathon before you actually race in the marathon. You train and you get strong, and in those little increments of training, you start to build the endurance because the race, it's going to deplete you completely. The recovery time is going to be too great. You wouldn't want to go a whole race before you actually have your race. And oftentimes the storms and the trials and the hardship in our lives, it's building us so that we can actually run the real race. There is a race that you and I are all running. You might not think it today. You might say, well, I'm not a runner. I don't know what I'm doing out here, but the Bible talks about all of us running our race. And we all have a finish line. And who will you be at the finish line? Will you be able to say, God, I trusted you. God, I was a woman of integrity. God, even though they attacked my character, I blessed those who hate me. I prayed for those who persecuted me. God, can I pass the test at the end of my life, standing before you saying, God, I surrendered and obeyed and gave you everything I had. Can you endure? see, it's Palm Sunday, which is the start of Holy Week. And it reminds us how Jesus rode in to Jerusalem. And they waved the palms and they shouted, Hosanna! Which really means, God help! They wanted Jesus to be their Savior, but differently than he was about to be. They wanted him to be a political leader. God, help, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. And he went through Jerusalem. 
and he endured their praises, knowing that soon their praise would turn to persecution. You see, all of us, it's easy to endure praise. When people are excited about you, when people are cheering you on, when your boss has given you a good job or a promotion, when people say nice words about you and say you're doing great, it's, it's easy to handle the praise. But endurance isn't about the praise. Endurance is about the persecution. It's about being able to remain humble through it all and know that, yes, God, he gave me the gifts that he gave me. He made me a vessel, but I am simply a humble servant. I'm not anything important. We're not anyone important. We're sinners who've been saved by grace. We're broken vessels in the hand of a holy, wonderful God. God, can I handle, Lord, when people turn their backs on me? When it feels like everyone is against me, can I endure? Can you endure? In this age, social media and so many different opinions, can you endure? Can you remain faithful to the word of God? Let me be very clear today. Our situation in our country, a lot of it is going to get worse. But the church needs to know who they are. And you'll never know who you are if you don't know the word of God. You don't, honestly, you can listen to as many sermons as you want. And I pray that you listen to people who are trying to be faithful stewards of God's word. But nothing compares to getting a word from God yourself when you open up a book that he wrote just for you to read. He wants to speak to you. He wants you to know your identity. He wants every area of your life. He wants your attractions. He wants to be the motivation for every decision that you make. He is not an accessory. He's not an addition. He's not a supplement. He's the whole thing. There's nothing better than knowing him and letting him rule and guide your life. Can you endure? Can you stay true? to who God has called you to be through all of it. Hebrews 12 verse 2 says this, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He saw you and I on the other side and he counted it joy. And I just want to be a church and I want to be a people and I want to encourage you to be able to stand in your life and say whether they welcome me and sing my praises or whether they crucify me and persecute me, I will be a person who endures. I will pass the endurance test. I will stay faithful. You will get to the other side. Let me exhort you and encourage you today. God's going to be with you. He's going to help you on days when you feel like you can't make it. Let his Holy Spirit guide you. Pass the test and endure. You and I, we have an opportunity to partner with God, but the truth is, is that none of us are really good at passing the test. Over and over and over again, we can fail the test. Anyone in the room who would say, I've failed before, I've messed up before, but thank God that he covers me, that he has a plan for me, that he redeems me. Jesus, he was tested in the wilderness. All on his own. And I'm sure that it was more than he could have imagined. But he was tested again in the garden and on the cross when he had all the power in the world to take himself off, to remove himself from that holy position of obedience. 
but he chose to endure more than he could handle. Physically, it cost him his life. And that's why you and I can do what James 1 tells us to do. Brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind, somebody say any kind, come your way. Consider it an opportunity for great joy. I just want to be a church that when we get here and we've got bad news, we're like, listen, I've got an opportunity. I know it's bad. I know it doesn't sound good. I know the doctors report, but I've got an opportunity. I know it doesn't look good or look like it's going to work in my favor, but I've got an opportunity. An opportunity for great joy when tests come our way, for we know that when our faith is tested, our endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, Scripture says. And when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. My daughter Nora, she's in kindergarten, and she already has spelling tests on Fridays. New York City, man. It's just insane. I was playing in a sandbox all of kindergarten, right? But she's got these tests, and she prepares all week to try to get the spelling right on her, her words that she has. But what I love about the test is that there's always a point at the bottom for extra credit. And typically, the extra credit is a word that they've already reviewed, and they already know. And so... They may get all of the other ones wrong in the test, but the extra credit makes up the difference of the whole test. And the reality is for you and for me is that over and over and over again, we've gotten the test wrong. If we went through each person, we could go through every failure, every heartache, every time we didn't obey, every time we delayed obedience, which is still disobedience, every time that we didn't quite hit the mark and we could say, God, here's my life. Look at all of the tests that I've failed. But then he sent his son, Jesus. And let me tell you today, Jesus is like extra credit. He comes on the scene and he makes up for every single mistake that you've made. He cancels quite literally all of your sin. Not one point does he hold against you when you come into relationship with you. He doesn't get you close to him just to tell you how wrong and messed up you are. He comes and he says, I got you covered. I'll make up the difference. I'm the God who saves. I'm not the God who just cleans you up. I'm the God who makes something brand new. Come on, where are my people who are grateful for our God and his amazing grace that Jesus came? He lived a perfect life and he died on the cross for our sin. He's a faithful God. He's a good God. I don't know if there's anyone in the room who's experienced his grace, but maybe if you have, why don't you give him some praise right now? Thank you, Jesus, that every sin you don't commit against me, God, every sin you don't hold against me, Lord, but you forgive me over and over again, all in the room, on our feet. Lord, we thank you that you are a good, faithful God. And I ask today that you would strengthen those of us who are in a season of testing. Lord, for those who are waiting, for those who are lifting, for those who are enduring, God, I pray today that we would be able to consider a joy when tests come our way because you, God, passed the ultimate test on our behalf. 
And so today, God, strengthen your people. Breathe new life back into them. God, would they be able to see what they're facing, God, as a small weight into what you're doing and what you're going to require of them. Lord, I pray that this would be a church who wouldn't shy away from surrender, who wouldn't shy away from sacrifice, God, but would gladly give you everything. I thank you, Lord, that this is a church that's enduring, that's going to pass the test, that's going to stand at the end of eternity, at the end of our lives, saying, God, I gave it all. And the Lord would say, well done good and faithful servant Lord I pray that you would encourage us in our faith that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit I thank you God that you're always with us and if you're here today and you would say you know what Jesus is not the Lord of my life all this surrender talk it won't matter if you've still got one foot with Jesus and one foot in the world You'll never be able to surrender it all unless you give him your whole heart. And I can't think of a better Sunday. I know it's Easter Sunday next week. Maybe you're thinking, well, let me just get something straight and come back next week and then I'll be really good to go. God doesn't care about all of that. He wants you right now. And if you would make a decision to give him your life, I promise you, you will never be the same. He wants to work in your life, transform you from the inside out. If that's you in the room and you know you're not surrendered to Jesus and you know you need to, on the count of three, would you lift your hand? One, two, three. You'd say, that's me. Lift your hand so I can see you and pray for you. I see you, 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 I see you there. I see you, I see you, I see you in the back. I see you, I see you over there. I see you. Come on, hands are going up all over the room. I see you. I see you. Come on, can we put our hands together for all God is doing right now? The Bible says when we confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we submit to him. We pray a prayer that we are saved. So right now we're going to pray this prayer together. Say, dear Jesus, I give you everything. I lay down my whole life. I give you my sin, my shame, all of the mess, and I ask for what you have, which is a new life for me. Today, God, I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. You rose again to give me new life. So I'm yours, Lord. I'm brand new. The best is yet to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Come on, can you honor Pastor Kristen for that amazing word?